Hello, everyone. Welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. So it is my pleasure uh, to welcome Dr. Georges to speak today. Dr. Georges received his undergraduate education at MIT, went on to attend medical school at UCSF, completed internal medicine residency at UT Southwestern Medical Center, and then fellowship here at the University of Washington in medical oncology. He's an associate member of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center and an associate professor of medicine here at UW. His areas of clinical expertise include hematopoietic stem cell transplantation for hematologic malignancies and autoimmune diseases, as well as treatment of acute and chronic graft-versus-host disease. He's been a major contributor in several areas of research, which have included finding effective strategies to enhance the graft-versus-host reaction and thus graft-versus-tumor effect, following allogeneic cell transplant in an effort to reduce disease relapse in several disease states. Um, studying mechanisms of immune tolerance following allogenetic hematopoietic cell transplant, and finding ways in which to better control and treat graft-versus-host disease, as well as reducing toxicity of stem cell transplant. So recently, his work has focused on the use of HCT and management of various autoimmune diseases, which we'll hear about more today. And his work has culminated in over 60 publications in peer-reviewed journals, and he has also authored 10 book chapters on the subject of hematopoietic cell transplantation. He serves on several major national committees, uh, which have included the NIH Immune Tolerance Working Group and also the NIH Panel on Hematologic Malignancies. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Georges as he speaks on what's new in hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and um, I apologize for starting a little bit late. Had some technical difficulties, some videos later on in the in the talk. Hopefully, they'll work out. They got flipped upside down somehow in the switch over um, to this computer. Well, so mostly I'll be. I hope it's a. It might be a little bit whirlwind tour, but um, I'm going to talk about four disease topics: the multiple sclerosis, systemic sclerosis stiff person syndrome and Crohn's disease and, and address some of the progress that we've made in each of these uh, disease categories using hematopoietic cell transplantation. So I'm basically going to review the rationale for either autologous versus allogeneic hematopoietic cell transplantation. Mostly I'll be talking about the autologous hematopoietic cell transplantation as that's the major emphasis of the, of the current clinical trials that we're doing. But toward the end, I'll talk about allogeneic hematopoietic cell transplant. In multiple sclerosis, I'll be updating you with the five-year result of the HALT-MS trial. Um, in systemic sclerosis, there are multiple trials that have been conducted, and I'll be uh, reviewing them in the current uh, trial that we're doing here in, in Seattle called the STATS <coughs> trial. And for stiff person syndrome, this is a uh, sort of a new area to evaluate. Um, and uh, uh, this, we've transplanted nine patients so far, and I have one sort of case vignette to share with you that I think is uh, indicative of the response that we're be seeing in this disease. And then uh, for Crohn's disease, I, I probably won't have that much time to talk about it. Um, I'm just summarizing the published results in autologous cell transplant and, and describing our current progress in the allogeneic hematopoietic cell transplant for Crohn's disease. So the use of stem cell transplant for autoimmune disease is basically applying the technology that's been developed for treatment in uh, hematopoietic malignancies and applying it to uh, uh, the autoimmune disease arena, and, um, but really trying to tailor it to the appropriateness of therapy for autoimmune disease. High-dose immunosuppressive therapy is really high-dose chemotherapy. and. Uh, anti-T cell antibody therapy combined and rescue uh, with autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplant. This achieves a rapid reduction in autoimmune effector cells. Basically, the chemotherapy kills T cells and B cells that are causing the autoimmune disease. But of course, it also damages the hematopoiesis, so we need to rescue the patient with autologous hematopoietic cells. It interestingly appears to have a sustained immunomodulatory effect, um, which is perhaps surprising um, to us in, in this field. And um, 
And there, in general, it's, there appears to be less transplant-related mortality or less risks of transplant doing an autologous transplant compared to doing an allogeneic transplant. And that's really why most of the work has been done in autologous stem cell transplants. Allogeneic hematopoietic cell transplant truly replaces the host immune system with donor cells. And, and we also are able to promote regulatory mechanisms that control the autoimmune disease uh, to achieve, for example, mixed donor host chimerism actually induces a state of tolerance, which can probably more effectively control the autoimmune disease. Um, where our focus in using allogeneic transplant is to use a reduced intensity conditioning regimen that should have less transplant related mortality. But graft versus host disease continues to remain a potential problem after allogeneic hematopoietic cell transplant. And that's probably why we really haven't um, made as much progress uh, using allo transplants. So, to give some background, uh, multiple sclerosis, you know, is talked about in the neurology grand rounds, not less probably in medicine grand rounds. Um, I'm a medical oncologist, I'm not a neurologist, but it's a fascinating disease, MS. It's an immune-mediated disease of the central nervous system, and it causes multiple demyelinating lesions and neuronal axonal loss. Um, it's fairly common among young adults, and it's a major cause of disability in the United States. The most common clinical courses are relapsing rem remitting disease, which is very inflammatory. It causes uh, very inflammatory uh, brain lesions. Um, and, uh, and later on in the course of disease, it appears to progress into something called secondary progressive, which has some inflammatory component, but much more degenerative demyelinating component and less inflammatory. So of course, um, as, you'll, as I'm going to mention several times, really our um, focus has been on uh, treating patients with stem cell transplant who have relapsing remitting uh, MS. The clinical course is sort of uh, depicted in the schema. Uh, neurologists have sort of outlined what, uh, what is the, dis uh, here EDSS is a measure of disability, so the higher the EDSS, the more disabled the patient is, and uh, over time, usually a matter of years. And in relapsing remitting disease, there's sort of an acute event uh, with a disability, but then it, the inflammation is treated, maybe or resolves with high dose prednisone. And there's some sustained disability, but then there's another flare up, uh, another flare up, but always a return back to more baseline function. But over time, there's actually progression of da neuronal damage and uh, disability. Um, primary progressive has less of this acute inflammatory phase uh, with the return to baseline. Secondary progressive is really described best as in, this, in its later phases where there's just less acute, acute changes, but just gradual progressive uh, degeneration. The diagnostic criteria for MS, white matter lesions of the central nervous system disseminated in space and time. <laughs> so MRI is very important uh, a tool to assess the, uh, to assess multiple sclerosis. There's a clinical assessment, brain MRI, evoked potentials have been done in the past, less so now. CSF oligoclonal bands prob probably used to be done more when I was a resident, less so now. I don't see it that commonly done by neurologists, but um, definitely the oligoclonal bands probably represent clonal autoantibodies against, the, against myelin uh, in, the, in the CSF. So the primary hallmark of the MS is the focal white matter lesions, so they're T1, T2, and gadolinium enhancing. Shown here is sort of a gadolinium, in this, uh, this uh, image is a, a gadolinium enhancement. Uh, here the, the ring is gadolinium enhancing, and then there's a new T2 lesion here. This is an acute event in, uh, in, uh, relap in, uh, in a relapsing remitting MS patient. Two months later, the enhancement is resolved. There's no longer enhancement around this lesion, but the T2 lesion persists. And so with this disease, there just is gradual progressive brain damage leading to this neuronal disability. And it's uh, particularly devastating for, for young patients. The EDSS score was developed as a shorthand way of summarizing some of the um, disability for uh, the patient's experience. And of course, the best way to measure, or not the best, but one of the ways to measure is just the ability to walk. And uh, over time, 
uh, there is a progression of disability so that maybe starting off with no or minimal disability, but uh, at, with an EDSS of five, patients are ambulatory uh, without assistance 200 meters, and then they have to stop. They're not able to walk any further. Um, by the time you're EDSS of six, you can only walk 100 meters, and you need a cane to do that, to do that walking. EDSS of seven, you need a wheelchair. EDSS eight, you're bedridden, and EDSS 10 is death. So the, um, I think what I also want to emphasize is that, unfortunately, I think a lot of patients come to us seeking help with stem cell transplant once their disease has progressed to wheelchair or uh, you know, very high advanced disability, and that's really um, too late. We're not able to reverse the course of the disease, dam of the damage that's been done by the time patients have, have advanced to, to such a degree of disability. Really, uh, we want to focus on patients that have moderate disability up to perhaps as high as an EDSS of five, uh, because there we can make the biggest difference in, in the outcome of their, of their disease the HALT-MS trial was done under the hypothesis that intensive immunosuppressive therapy supported by autologous hematopoietic cell transplant would arrest the disease activity in individuals with poor risk MS. Poor risk MS meaning patients that have broken through their immune suppressive therapy and had progression of disease despite treatment. Uh, the study design is a prospective open label single arm multi-center trial. And the primary objective was to assess the five-year durability of disease stabilization in MS patients. It, the the event-free survival during the five years after high-dose therapy was the primary endpoint. We also developed a composite endpoint, which I'll review in the slides, uh, focusing on disease relapse with no new, looking for no new evidence of uh, uh, signs or symptoms of MS persisting for more than 48 hours looking for new MRI abnormalities or progression of disability and increase in the EDSS score or, or mortality. So this is a composite endpoint that's sort of similar to something that's no evidence of disease activity. Um, it's not exactly NIDA, uh, and I'll, but it has to do with the time frame that we're looking at the evidence of disease progression, but it was really the first study that was prospectively designed to evaluate evidence of disease activity after, after transplant, I mean after treatment for MS. The eligibility are listed here. I really uh, let you look at them. Basically, we were focused on younger patients uh, up to age 60, but the oldest patient was 52 years old. MS duration less than 15 years. Uh, EDSS score of 3 to 5.5, not higher uh, than that. Um, and definitely having two or more relapses in the prior 18 months, so on therapy, developing relapses. So um, unlike other disease, uh, unlike other trials in MS where uh, patients are, are not on therapy and given a treatment, this is patients who have disease progression while on, while on therapy, uh, standard FDA approved therapy, and, uh, and despite that are having progression of their disability. So there were 25 patients enrolled in the trial. Median age was 37 years, mostly women. The baseline EDSS median was 4.5. Um, the disease duration was about five years. And patients had pri received prior therapy, which is pretty standard therapy used uh, for uh, MS patients in the, in the United States during the years of the study. Um, first, we mobilized and collected autologous peripheral blood stem cells with GCSF for five days, con concurrent prednisone to reduce uh, potential risk of flare of the autoimmune disease from the GCSF. Uh, because stem cells are mobilized after GCSF treatment for five days, we then perform apheresis procedure. The cells were CD34 selected with immunomagnetic bead uh, technology. Cells were cryopreserved. Then we moved on to the high-dose immunosuppressive therapy using the BEAM regimen combined with antithymocyte globulin. So this is just a very standard, um, the most commonly used conditioning, transplant conditioning regimen for lymphoma in the, United, in the, in the world, basically. And this is just a, a BCNU or carmustine, etoposide, cytarabine, and then uh, melphalan. And tucked in there is also rabbit ATG on day minus two and day minus one with the stem cell infusion on day zero. So it's this regimen that's been successfully used to treat lymphoma, uh, killing T cells and B cells very effectively. 
uh, uh, use applying it to to the MS patient and adding uh, antibody rabbit ATG uh, on, on to help further deplete T cells in the in the in the patient. After stem cell infusion, uh, patients receive GCSF until uh, neutrophil recovery, and they also receive concurrent prednisone to help prevent or treat, uh, to prevent engraftment syndrome from developing, uh, to prevent flare of MS uh, during the time of uh, hematopoietic cell engraftment. Here are the results. Um, the uh, primary endpoint was event-free survival or no evidence of the disease, uh, and uh, at five years, the event-free survival was 69.2%, so 70% you know, event-free survival. There were seven, uh, of, this is of the, of the 25 patients, there were seven patients that met an endpoint. Two had an increase in EDSS, sort of clinical disease uh, disability progressing. Three patients had clinical relapse um, that was treated with the high-dose prednisone. Uh, two patients met endpoint by MRI criteria. And there were no deaths prior to any of these endpoints being, being met. The relapse-free survival, therefore, was uh, 88, basically 87%. Uh, this, is, um, uh, this is with the, uh, uh, and the MRI activity-free survival, 86%. And the disease progression-free survival was 91%. Uh, two, uh, worsen, two patients had worsening of their EDSS score. Overall survival was 86%. There were three deaths uh, in, the, in the trial, and these deaths were unrelated to the transplant. The, the, uh, patient, some of the patients had significant medical comorbidities, and all of the patients died after disease progression, uh, you know, had, had already met an endpoint and then went on and then had a had death after that. So the um, other... Uh, features of this is that um, we, the MRIs were done uh, many times, uh, at six months after, before transplant, six months after transplant, and then annually. And um, uh, perhaps Dr. Godwin is more uh, excited about this data, but, there's, uh, but there, are, uh, there are definitely T1 and T2 lesion volumes that were measured uh, among all the patients, and there was really a reduction in the T2 uh, lesion volume in the brain which really represents that there was less, on average, less activity, less activity of the MS in, in these patients. And there, although there was an initial decline at six months after transplant in brain volume, at three to five years after transplant, the brain volume decreased stabilized. There was no further loss of brain volume. You know, naturally, there is sort of a, a gradual decline in brain volume uh, as we age. Uh, and, and although there was an initial decrease here, there was, it's significant that there was a stabilization of the brain volume loss. So in summary, high-dose immune suppressive therapy, the BEAM plus ATG regimen, and autologous stem cell transplant with CD34-selected cells was well-tolerated with very few serious early complications. There were the standard events that occur after stem cell transplant that we are very familiar with and can support patients through the mucositis, the neutropenia. Um, certainly, you, wouldn't, you, you do this at a center that does stem cell transplants with physicians that are familiar with taking care of patients uh, with, this, uh, with this process, but it's uh, easily manageable. High-dose immunosuppressive therapy was very effective for inducing sustained remission of highly active relapsing remitting MS until through five years after transplant. No disease-modifying therapy so the patients did not go back on their standard immunosuppressive therapy after the transplant. They, this, this treatment abrogated the need for maintaining, uh, for continuing disease modifying therapy unless the patient experienced a relapse or increase in EDSS. So two patients had the increase in EDSS and then they were, and then they, uh, one of them went on disease modifying therapy. MRI lesions overall were decreased in volume and brain volume stabilized at years three through five after transplant. So just a, another uh, interesting aspect of this, of this studies, uh, this is just a schematic to remind of the T cell receptor alpha beta rearrangement and the alpha chain and the beta chain with the VDJ uh, rearrangement that occurs in the germline DNA to make the beta, uh, beta chain of the T cell receptor subunit. Um, and, uh, and so using uh, sequencing technology, 
we were able to analyze T-cell repertoire uh, following autologous stem cell transplant in NMS. High throughput deep TCR uh, beta sequencing was done to assess millions of individual T-cell receptors per patient uh, at baseline and at two months and 12 months after transplant. The stem cell transplant had a distinct effect on CD4 and CD8 T-cell repertoire. In CD4 cells, the dominant T-cell receptor clones present before treatment were difficult to detect or undetectable after, after transplant, um, shown by these uh, green bars. There are very few, they're, they're detectable but in each patient, but they're uh, few uh, compared to pre-transplant. And, um, and patients largely developed a new T-cell receptor repertoire in their CD4 cells. In contrast, in CD8 cells, the uh, CD8 clones were not as effectively removed, and the reconstituted CD8 T-cell repertoire uh, had a combination of both uh, clonal expansion of cells present before treatment uh, with new, with new T-cells. So, interestingly, patients who failed to respond to treatment or who had disease relapse at two years or three years after the transplant had less diversity and their T-cell repertoire early during the immune reconstitution process. There are some additional studies that, are, that will be reported on uh, evaluating the T-cell repertoire in the cerebrospinal fluid and in the peripheral blood um, in, in, the, in the near future. And there are some interesting findings about the reoccurrent patterns of the T-cell receptor in, in uh, sequences that are evident in the CSF, which probably relate uh, in patients who have, who, who had those patients that had disease progressions compared to the patients who did not. So uh, this is just to acknowledge that this is a study done, a multi-center study um, involving uh, a, a wonderful collaboration with neurologists and transplant physicians uh, here in Seattle at, at Baylor and at uh, Ohio State University. And, um, and so this, is, this was a, um, uh, so this study was supported by the uh, grants from the NIH and uh, it, Immune Tolerance Network. So just to sort of come back to ask, which MS patients should be referred for transplant? Uh, probably patients that have relapsing remitting MS. I am not showing you all the data. Other studies have been done to show that there's less efficacy when, uh, when uh, less uh, durability of response in patients who have the secondary progressive MS. Um, and ideally patients that have an EDSS score uh, that's lower. So I think uh, before they develop permanent disability, it would be ideal, and if patients are having relapses, meaning uh, new, uh, new MRI lesions and new progression of the autoimmune disease, uh, despite being on therapy, those patients should come for stem cell transplant. And patients who have advanced EDSS score who are wheelchair bound, it basically have poor outcome, and this is sort of understandable from the perspective of uh, developing pneumonia or developing um, uh, being, be, uh, having less mobility increases the risk for uh, complications after, after transplant, especially during the phase of neutropenia. Which transplant regimen? I really am sort of, haven't really reviewed all of the data for you here, but um, there are several clinical trials that have been published recently uh, for autologous stem cell transplant for MS in Europe, in Canada, at, uh, Chicago, Northwestern, and, uh, and here now. Um, I would say that, uh, in my opinion, that the BEAM ATG regimen is very well tolerated and uh, probably is, um, is probably the, the most frequently used regimen for treating MS patients. Total body radiation with, combined with cyclophosphamide is effective, but it's probably too, it's probably stronger or a more intense regimen that is probably not necessary for treating MS patients. Um, and there's also the potential risk of developing uh, secondary myelodysplastic syndrome uh, late after the uh, after a TBI-based conditioning regimen. Canadians have used the busulfan cyclophosphamide regimen and recently published on, on this, uh, but there's the risk of developing veno-occlusive disease with the busulfan, and so this is probably, um, so there's some risk of mortality using this regimen. And other uh, centers, like for example in Chicago and in Sweden, have been using cyclophosphamide plus ATG, and uh, this is effective uh, regimen, but probably at this dose of cyclophosphamide, we're reaching the maximum tolerated dose of a single drug. And so it seems to me that the beam AT, and basically all of the studies show about 70% at five years, uh, pro, you know, progression-free uh, survival. So it's probably best to use a well-tolerated regimen that's efficacious 
uh, without risking the toxicities from, from these other regimens. Is CD34 selection really necessary? I didn't really dwell on this, but I said that we were doing immunomagnetic selection of the cells, and the, uh, I would, my answer is probably not. Um, there, uh, it, it, it appears that the use of the anti-thymocyte globulin, the ATG, cause, uh, produces effective in vivo depletion of T cells that might be reinfused with the stem cell, uh, uh, if there are T cells with the stem cells infused back, and that uh, CD34 selection just increases the potential risk of infection, and the technology is really not widely available, and in the future we hope to be able to offer this uh, stem cell transplant to patients uh, you know, throughout the country. So now I'm going to compare, I want to compare, <laughs> this slide is attempting to, uh, as a schematic to compare uh, uh, outcome of transplant in these two, uh, in the red and the blue here, versus uh, best available biologic therapy. And so these are, of course, no randomized clinical trial that has yet been done uh, doing this, and so it's the best of our ability to analyze the data of the clinical trials and evaluate what are the outcomes of comparable patients treated with current therapy and new therapy. Basically, um, uh, in orange here is the progression of uh, worsening of MS disease in patients uh, who are on placebo arm of studies. Here in the dark green are uh, results of treatment on clinical trials um, including uh, Tisabri, the natalizumab, or ocrelizumab, a new CD20, uh, anti-CD20 antibody. And basically, dis uh, despite their claim, you know, despite being better than placebo, than, you know, placebo uh, it's really, it doesn't appear to be more, definitely less effective than, than, uh, than stem cell transplant. The, uh, the blue line is a, is a result of, of uh, uh, autologous stem cells transplant uh, trial in Sweden. Uh, so, um, and this, this data point is actually incorrect. It's actually at 70% uh, uh, at five-year disease-free survival. The red is, is equal to the um, Swedish study. So I think these, these suggest that uh, it's not a, that um, autologous stem cell transplant is more effective than standard immunosuppressive therapy. And, um, and so this compels us to ask whether we should do a, a randomized clinical trial to really evaluate this. And these are some projections of what would happen if we did a, a randomized clinical trial comparing um, uh, the uh, event-free survival curves after autologous stem cell transplant compared to current uh, uh, known data from patients receiving Tisabri, natalizumab, or ocrelizumab. And this uh, purple line here is sort of a in case there was maybe some better uh, biologic therapy available. These, these, uh, these, these projections help us to design the number of patients that we need to do a randomized clinical trial, and our current estimate is that we need to do about uh, 50 to 60 patients in each uh, treatment arm to really uh, accurately determine if there is really a significant difference between these two, uh, between these two treatments. So in future directions, we plan for a randomized clinical trial comparing high-dose immune suppressive therapy and autologous stem cell transplant compared to best available approved uh, therapy. And this will be an NIH-funded study uh, sponsored, uh, conducted with the Immune Tolerance Network and the Bone Marrow Transplant Clinical Trials Network. Actually, autologous uh, hematopoietic cell transplant is probably less expensive and very cost-effective compared to biologic therapy. Biologic therapy currently costs seventy to $90,000 a year and that you have to continue using this therapy each year. So uh, stem cell transplant maybe is about $250,000, $300,000, and uh, probably is more effective. And so we can uh, spare brain damage and progression of disease and more patients doing uh, one-time autologous stem cell transplant compared to uh, ongoing biologic therapy. The um, other possibilities to consider are phase two clinical trial of allogeneic transplant for primary and secondary progressive MS. Um, if we can, uh, and I'll try and address that toward the end, if we can reduce the risk of, uh, uh, reduce the risk of um, uh, GVHD. And uh, basically the thought about using this for primary progressive or secondary progressive MS is that a retrospective study that we've conducted showed that allogeneic stem cell transplant uh, after allo transplant, there was a re resolution of oligoclonal bands in this cerebrospinal fluid. 
So now I want to change direction, change topics and uh, hurry up and talk about systemic sclerosis, um, scleroderma. Scleroderma really is, uh, this is a schematic showing the damage in the skin with a collagen deposition, uh, progressively increasing with fibrosis. The um, uh, clinical appearance is uh, sort of uh, sausage fingers with uh, really necrotic lesions in the digits as well. The criteria for classification of uh, systemic sclerosis is skin thickening and the fingers, both hands, uh, uh, and also uh, the presence of uh, fingertip lesions, telangiectasias, but, in, but the concern, of course, is also when the scleroderma it progresses from the just the skin involvement to internal organ involvement. <coughs> Interstitial lung disease in scleroderma is uh, pretty significant and can be it ultimately is a very poor prognosis finding for patients with scleroderma. Here we see a uh, sort of typical uh, interstitial lung disease, uh, ground glass appearance on CT scan um, with the pleural effusion and, uh, and, and uh, as well as um, uh, patchless esophagus as well. The extent of internal organ involvement influences the survival in limited and diffuse forms of systemic sclerosis. In diffuse uh, systemic sclerosis, mortality rate is five to eight times higher than the general population. This is basically a fatal illness if there's diffuse systemic sclerosis. Uh, patients with limited skin involvement still have two times higher uh, mortality in the, than the general population. Here's an example of a, a survival curve of patients with systemic sclerosis. These are sort of older data uh, published in 2003, but patients with systemic sclerosis really do uh, have a shorter lifespan. Um, here's a more recent evaluation of patients with uh, limited or diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis, either uh, their uh, life expectancy with no internal organ complications or with internal organ compl complications. Once the disease involves the internal organs such as the lung, heart, kidney, uh, GI tract, the mortality is uh, definitely uh, uh, more severe. Conventional management of systemic sclerosis is just inadequate. There's a broad range of immunosuppressive therapy that's been studied. Nothing has really been shown to be effective for scleroderma. Uh, there was a study of scleroderma lung study, cyclophosphamide versus placebo. There was less decrease in force vital capacity at one year after cyclophosphamide treatment, but that uh, effect was lost at two years after, after treatment. Mycophenolate mofetil is another agent that's used in systemic sclerosis, but it uh, is, not, is not profoundly effective in altering uh, disease course for the majority of patients. It helps, helps some patients, though. We asked whether or not autologous uh, stem cell transplant would be helpful to, as I described previously, similar with the MS uh, story, to re cause a rapid reduction of the autoimmune effector cells and, and asked whether there could be a sustained immunomodulatory effect. The initial study was done here uh, under the, un by Richard Nash in uh, Seattle, uh, high dose therapy and autologous stem cell transplant. Patients had high-risk disease with diffuse skin disease and internal organ involvement, primarily lung. And the uh, conditioning regimen involved the use of total body radiation, cyclophosphamide, and CD34 selected autologous stem cells. There was also horse ATG added to the conditioning regimen to further in vivo deplete T cells uh, 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 that, that may have survived the conditioning regimen. After the initial 12 patients, the regimen was modified to uh, provide lung shielding and kidney shielding so that the lung and kidney would receive only 200 centigrade or two gray total body radiation. Uh, this probably was most effective in improving the survival of patients after transplant and future studies used the TBI with the lung shielding. Patients had a, sig a significant improvement in their skin score, so their scleroderma dramatically Im uh, improved, uh, their skin uh, tightness improved tremendously after stem cell transplant, and this effect was persisted for five and more years after, after the autologous stem cell transplant. Um, there was also a functional improvement. Patients had improved quality of life, and uh, pulmonary function was uh, perhaps slightly improved uh, or at least stable after the after autologous uh, stem cell transplant. And uh, overall, sorry, overall survival at five years was 
progression-free survival was 64%. If we exclude the patients that did not have lung shielding uh, or had, uh, who had significant uh, uh, organ uh, function abnormality in the pre-transplant, uh, this would have been the uh, survival. Uh, it was 78% survival at five years after transplant. The next study, uh, so there have been three major studies. The ASSIST trial uh, done in Chicago, the ASTIS trial performed in Europe, and the SCOT trial performed here in the United States and Canada. And, um, and basically, the, uh, the, 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 uh, both the ASSIST and ASTIS trial have been published. The SCOT trial is finally um, completed and will be presented at the American College of Rheumatology meeting in an oral session on November 15th. Um, the, uh, uh, there were 75 patients in the US trial, 156 patients in the European trial, and a smaller number of patients in the Chicago trial. In the European trial, um, patients were randomized to either receive stem cell transplant or receive monthly pulse cyclophosphamide. And uh, basically, uh, after uh, already as early as two years after transplant, there was improved survival and uh, improved event-free survival in the patients receiving stem cell transplant compared to the cyclophosphamide control group. There was, um, there was however, a 10% tr transplant-related mortality in the stem cell transplant group. And it, this, this group of patients received the cyclophosphamide 200 milligram per kilogram and a rabbit ATG as conditioning regimen. The, the US study, the scleroderma uh, uh, cyclophosphamide or transplant uh, trial uh, involved um, the TBI with the lung shielding to two gray, but eight gray of TBI to the rest of the body, cyclophosphamide at 120 milligram per kilogram with horse ATG and C34 selected cells compared to cyclophosphamide. The, um, the results uh, uh, are, I'm not really able to tell you about the results because they've been embargoed, but we're very pleased with the results. <laughs> <laughs> so you can take that to mean that it's probably favorable for, for transplant. The, um, the, uh, the, the, of, of concern, though, is that the 8-grade TBI regimen is effective, but two patients had late complication of myelodysplastic syndrome, a pre-malignant condition, and this may be as a result of the, so about 6% rate risk of uh, developing MDS after a TBI-based conditioning regimen. The, uh, the European trial uh, showed improved overall survival after uh, autologous stem cell transplant with a transplant-related mortality of 10%. And we asked uh, in, in the current study that we're conducting called the STAT trial, um, uh, scleroderma uh, treatment autologous <laughs> transplant, as whether we could do, whether can we confirm the ASTIS study with 200, uh, 200 mg per kg of cyclophosphamide without CD34 selection using just uh, an unfractionated peripheral blood stem cells to re and reduce the risk of relapse after transplant by using MMF maintenance therapy after transplant. So the current trial is to give MMF uh, after high dose as maintenance therapy after high dose uh, uh, after cyclophosphamide 200 mg per kg ATG transplant see if that could prevent disease progression and, and reduce the risk of disease progression in those 20% of patients that had uh, disease progression after, with, of their scleroderma after autologous transplant in the European study. So this uh, study is currently active, uh, multi-center multi study, and uh, the entry criteria are the same as for the Scott trial. Uh, but as you can see, there is fairly advanced uh, disease the, um, your skin score is, uh, has to be high. The, um, the, the exclusion is the DLCO less than 40% or forced vital capacity less than 45%. We really uh, allow patients with fairly advanced uh, uh, interstitial lung disease to, to on, on the trial. Um, and so the schema is to give cyclophosphamide uh, for four doses and then horse ATG um, and then the autologous uh, peripheral blood stem cells that were not CD34 selected. The interim uh, outcome so far is that there is an improvement in the skin score in the majority of patients. The uh, DLCO um, uh, appears to actually improve in, in, uh, in, uh, in many of the patients after, after the trial. And, um, and the survival so far is 85% uh, with 14 patients on the trial. There have been, unfortunately, two deaths 
uh, so far on, on the study. One patient uh, had met endpoint by being on, by uh, being, uh, requiring dialysis for longer than six months. So the two deaths, one was due to sepsis, one was due to a progression of interstitial lung disease that were early after transplant, and one patient uh, required dialysis, uh, had scleroderma kidney uh, disease and required dialysis after six, beyond six months. This, is, this regimen with cyclophosphamide has resulted in eight of 12 patients that, are, sorry, eight of 14 patients, I'm sorry, that were treated in intensive care unit setting. So it's probably a more in, a difficult regimen to administer uh, this high-dose cyclophosphamide to patients compared to the total body radiation uh, regimen that we gave in the Scott trial. And so I would, my tentative conclusion, it's probably too early to say this, but my sense is that the high-dose cyclophosphamide 200 mg per kg has a substantial early toxicity in patients with advanced uh, systemic sclerosis, uh, and that it's related to the, their advanced internal organ dysfunction. And, um, and we may see, uh, we appear to have less uh, toxicity with the TBI-based regimen when we use the lung and uh, kidney shielding. We've made some revisions to the trial to uh, have a cardiac, a more intensive cardiac screening to prevent patients who have scleroderma heart involvement to be enrolled in the trial. Um, and I'm skipping some of that data because of lack of time. Uh, and then, um, and really our conclusions is that severe systemic sclerosis is a life-threatening disease with a very high degree of morbidity. And there are really no other effective therapies for patients with uh, scleroderma and high-dose immunosuppressive therapy uh, and autologous stem cell transplant is effective in preventing disease progression. The um, STAT trial is still ongoing and in investigating the safety and effectiveness of post-transplant maintenance therapy. And really to date, we've seen no patients with disease progression uh, or recurrence or progression of their scleroderma while on MMF maintenance therapy after, after transplant. So, um, Tentative conclusions, the cyclophosphamide 200 mg per kg may be suitable for patients with better lung and uh, heart function. Eight grade TBI with lung shielding and kidney shielding with the lower dose of cyclophosphamide may have superior efficacy with less toxicity, but there's the problem of the potential risk of myelodysplastic syndrome, uh, about 6% after transplant. And this would lead us to consider alternative regimens and considering a thiotipa cyclophosphamide regimen where we use less cyclophosphamide uh, than the Psi 200 to uh, treat patients with either lung, renal, heart, with more advanced lung, renal, heart involvement. So, changing gears again, I want to talk about a completely different disease called stiff person syndrome. This is a highly, an extremely rare disease. It's highly unusual. I think um, I'm presenting it here because about two and a half years ago, our, pa our first patient with stiff person syndrome was actually came here to Grand Rounds. Uh, for the, uh, 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 to sort of describe what the disease was, because no one had ever heard of this disease, neither had I, actually. Um, and it's really, auto, appears to be autoimmunity against GABA, aminobutyric acid, ergic neurons. So basically, patients are unable to relax their muscles. And there's excessive rig rigidity of lumbar trunk proximal limb muscles that cause sustained muscular contractions in both agonist and antagonist muscles. Patients have what appears to be a Frankenstein gait with frequent falls, a startle reflex with episodic muscle spasms. On physical exam, patients have muscle hardening with board-like sensation. There's paroxysmal autonomic dysfunction with apnea, cyanosis, basically, when patients have this um, startle reflex with muscle spasm, they stop breathing, and so, of course, they become apneic. There's a, we can measure an antibody to glutamic acid decarboxylase, uh, antibody against the N-terminus of this protein, uh, GAD65, that's uh, in about two-thirds of patients diagnosed with stiff person syndrome. EMG reveals, electromyography reveals continuous motor unit activity with agonist and antagonist muscles co-contraction. Co There's really no substantial neuropathology that's, uh, that's been con con conclusively identified, but uh, it's really not been adequately studied. So there was a case report uh, about uh, in two, 2015 of two patients with stiff person syndrome uh, that were treated with autologous transplant in, in Ottawa, Canada. 
And on our current protocol, we've transplanted nine patients in Seattle and Denver, and um, we'd like to, we need further follow-up of, of these patients. The first patient was a 27-year-old woman who was a pediatric ICU nurse uh, with severe refractory stiff person syndrome. Um, she was diagnosed based on neuro exam findings and had rapid progressive decline. The, um, she was treated with multiple courses of high-dose prednisone, chronic prednisone, plasma exchange three, uh, three times, IVIG every two weeks, rituximab, MMF therapy for, 18, for 15 months. She required 210 milligrams of diazepam a day. Uh, she was on high doses of baclofen. She had a baclofen pump implanted in her in, in, intrathecal space that was giving 650 microgram per day of baclofen in addition to the oral baclofen. She had, despite this, she had multiple, multiple episodes of muscle spasms through the day that required additional diazepam, Dilaudid, and Benadryl. She was severely disabled. She came to us here in Seattle in a wheelchair. She could only walk a few steps with assistance, and she had multiple falls, and she would, uh, so she, her life was basically, um, uh, you know, combined to a wheelchair. Um, EMG com completed here showed abnormal co-contraction of agonist and antagonist muscles with continued motor unit activity. She went to transplant in May of 2014. I'm trying to, hopefully I can, this will work. I, it, this was the, my technical problem. Here's a, here's a video. Of her. She's allowed us to show this video. This is her mother taking on her cell phone a video of her. This is the sort of gait with, that she has. See this stiff legs, basically, is what I want you to see. It sort of falls into that Frankenstein gait uh, sort of uh, classification. It's really hard for her to move, and, and, this, uh, but, and her legs are, are board-like and stiff. Um, the, here is a video of her, yeah, sorry, um, in, in the hospital bed uh, here, and she's having a spasm attack uh, right now, and uh, she becomes just bored with board-like rigidity. Um, this was based, uh, this was a startle response based on a door slam in the adjacent room. Um, so, interestingly, after transplant, with this beam ATG regimen, eight months after transplant, she had regained a lot of activity. Here she is running. And uh, this is just another video where she's just more fluid movements. I mean, she's just saying hi and she's talking to her mother, but she's just more fluid movements. She's now... Um, a nurse in the stem cell transplant unit in Birmingham, <laughs> Alabama. So, um, so we have seen similar improvements in other patients with stiff person syndrome. I think this was the most dramatic case and she allowed us to show uh, these videos because really the, the extent of the disease the, um, is really, the MRIs are normal, you know, there's the blood tests are just for the GAD65, it's really the physical exam and the gait that, that's profoundly uh, uh, significant. So in the few minutes that are left, I want to just basically touch on Crohn's disease. Uh, Crohn's disease, autoimmune disease of the GI tract. Um, and uh, to sort of say it simply, a randomized clinical trial of autologous stem cell transplant versus standard therapy in patients with Crohn's disease did not show sustained improvement of GI symptoms in the transplant arm. Um, so this was a study conducted in Europe they used the cyclophosphamide 200 ATG regimen. It was published in JAMA uh, in December of last year. And, um, and although it was a small study, only 23 uh, patients versus 21, uh, they were not able to see a significant improvement in the, um, in the Crohn's disease activity index score or a sustained improvement. Patients actually did improve, uh, but there, it, was not a, it was not apparent that it was a sustained improvement. This is a complicated study because it was a crossover at one year. Patients who did not get transplant were then switched over to, to get a transplant. And so it became perhaps difficult to fully evaluate the long-term effects of the treatment. But, um, but actually, more patients who received transplant were eventually able to stop maintenance, you know, their immunosuppressive therapy uh, compared, to the, compared to patients not getting uh, treatment. But it was, it was sort of a, probably a problem of not enough patients uh, in the study to see a statistical significant difference and also um, 
not enough, uh, um, and then the crossover also blurred the long-term evaluation of the efficacy of the, of the autologous transplant. So here in Seattle, uh, we've tried an, a, a different approach, and I'm not really going to go into huge detail. Uh, allogeneic stem cell transplant for severe refractory Crohn's, two patients only treated. These patients had uh, multiple uh, GI surgeries. The two patients treated had had three or four GI surgeries with resection of their Crohn's, failed all known treatments of their Crohn's disease, and were really dis disabled from, from this. And on TPN, and uh, just uh, with a lot of abdominal pain, high-dose narcotics. They received HLA-matched unrelated donor uh, bone marrow transplant with a non-myeloblative conditioning regimen, fludarabine, cyclophosphamide, and two-gray total body radiation. Um, both patients received a male, and uh, were, both patients were female, received a male, had male donors. Uh, so that was interesting, as you'll see. And then for GVHD prophylaxis, they received post-transplant cyclophosphamide, as is used in the haploidentical transplant regimen, MMF intercrolimus, with a planned uh, course of immune suppression for one year. The initial uh, transplant was well tolerated. Unfortunately, uh, the first patient, uh, after departure from Seattle, was non-compliant with her GVHD medications, developed GVHD, um, and uh, uh, was treated, uh, it continued to be non-compliant uh, despite uh, requests to, to you know, stressing the importance of compliance by taking tacrolimus MMF, MMF. She developed my profound steroid myopathy, had multiple falls, developed aspiration pneumonia, and uh, was hospitalized here and requested withdrawal of treatment supportive care and died at 11.5 months after transplant. Uh, endoscopy performed uh, two weeks prior to her death showed no evidence of Crohn's disease. Patient number two, on the other hand, had a much better outcome. Um, this patient had initially engrafted with 93, with mixed chimerism, 93% donor T-cell chimerism in the peripheral blood, but continued as we had uh, instructed her on the tocrolimus and MMF uh, uh, immune suppression because we were trying to avoid graft versus host disease. However, at six months after transplant, she returned home and she had developed recurrent abdominal pain and diarrhea. EGD uh, showed recurrence of Crohn's. And high, and actually biopsies showed a high level of host chimerism. So there was persistent T cells in the intestinal mucosa, and we could test this by the Y fish probe. Um, the peripheral blood had 86% donor T cell chimerism, and so this was unusual finding for us to see this split chimerism that the GI tract lymphocytes were not as high level donor chimerism. We had never looked before, and it was just an interesting observation. Here's an, I'm trying to show the slides that were the, the, this is at day 180 and the jejunum crick, the CD8 cells are purple uh, and the CD4 cells are red. These purple cells are CD8 cells. These are CD4 uh, cells. The arrows are identifying the Y probe male uh, donor cells. She had basically in certain, re especially uh, for example here in the, you know, in the colon, she had 50% host. In the jejunum, she had 90% um, host cells, female cells in the, in the jejunum. So we, and even though she had active symptoms of Crohn's disease, we actually withdrew immune suppression. This resulted in increase in the peripheral blood chimerism and a res resolution of her abdominal pain and diarrhea. So actually increasing the donor chimerism by, with, by withdrawing immunosuppression led to the resolution of the Crohn's uh, symptoms. She had essentially normal EGD at one year and two years. The patient has returned to work full-time without GI symptoms and is currently two years after transplant. So in summary, these preliminary findings suggest that we can find we have a low toxicity conditioning regimen with a relatively low risk of graft versus host disease, but more work needs to be done to determine what the risk is and that we can achieve stable mixed hematopoietic chimerism after allogeneic transplant. The approach may be effective in controlling certain severe refractory autoimmune diseases, such as Crohn's or a primary progressive MS or others, and we need longer follow-up and more patients. I would say that autologous stem cell transplant is highly effective for certain patients with diseases such as relapsing remitting MS, scleroderma, and stiff person syndrome, but that other autoimmune diseases that are refractory to autologous stem cell transplant
may benefit from an allogeneic transplant if the patient's comorbidity index coming into transplant is low. So with this, thank you for your attention. Um, and I also thank my collaborators and, and the people who have worked so hard to make all of these clinical trials possible. Thank you. Thank you.